Good morning. Good morning. Today is Sunday, July. Wrote it down. Tenth. <laughs> July tenth. We're not oriented, but we are here. <laughs> to date and time. <laughs> so uh, our talk today is about the I that is we. Our whole theme this month of July, starting from today on, is about the importance of relationship, the importance of uh, importance of togetherness. And would you grab my book, the 365? Let's mm. <laughs> see, I neglect, I usually enlarge the prayer I'm going to do, and I fail to do so today. So I'll read it from the book. Uh, this is Ernest Holmes from 365. And he says, I'm going to do a shortened version. And so you could say this to yourself as I do. It's an aff affirmative prayer. Today, I know that my good is at hand. I see this good in persons, places, and things. Nothing but goodness can go from me and nothing but goodness can return to me. There is nothing unlike goodness in my experience. There is nothing but kindness, nothing but generosity. My whole being responds to this goodness and recognizes it everywhere. Feeling, feeling it everywhere, seeing it everywhere, I'm enveloped in it. And even as I draw this goodness to me and become saturated with it, it flows out in every direction, blessing everything it touches, helping everyone, bringing wholeness and happiness to everyone. Quote, his goodness endureth forever. It's a Bible quote, but I don't know from where. And I endure forever. In joy, then, I awake in every new day. In joy, I rest in the eternal goodness. And evermore, there is a song in my heart as it overflows with the acknowledgement of good. And so it is. Beautiful. So, um, <clears throat> you know, Ernest Holmes doesn't talk a lot about friendship, but he does talk a lot about the oneness of all of humanity. And... Um, I remember before I got into this teaching when I was in my agnostic phase and, uh, you know, I was in my twenties and I was, it was all about becoming all that I could be. And it was all about me against the world. And um, when I came into this understanding of what we teach about that we're all one, it, it totally shifted how I felt about everyone else. Instead of it was, me against the world, me against everybody else. It was me with everybody else. And it felt so good. It felt so good to look at my neighbors that I might've seen as other or people that I thought of as other uh, to know, no, we are all the body of God. So philosophically, when we think about the I that is we, you know, this I, I am myself, but I am also part of, of this we of the humanity uh, all of humanity so we start with that metaphysical um uh, knowledge but before i do that shall we talk about some of the problems we're seeing in our society where that's not apparent problems <laughs> yeah like shooting each other <laughs> and uh, kids shooting kids well, what a, lately in order to <laughs> I think uh, avoid me? some of the en endless uh, bad news. Uh, I've suddenly turned to more animal planet type mm -hmm. videos yeah. and documentaries. And But what's really interesting to me when I look at that is that if you were to ask the deer if the lion was a good friend, uh, the deer would say definitely not. Uh, and, and yet you see there's a relationship between the two of them that requires each of them be players in, in, in each other's lives. And there are no extras, and there is no separation. Uh, they're they're equally as valuable. And the most powerful thing that happens for me is I, I watch a, a lion stalking a helpless little deer, and I feel bad for the deer, and and I hope for the deer until the deer has been caught and taken home to feed the baby lions. <laughs> and so you see these cute little cubs who are definitely a part of the plan as well. And it's difficult to separate out the good from the bad, except to say that if something bad is happening to you, you're welcome to say that it's a bad experience for you, but is it bad in the big picture? I, I really don't know. And so often we judge the big picture 
to be right or wrong based on our needs rather than relationships. Uh, the other piece that comes to me too is that right now we live in Florida, as do a lot of the people who attend our, 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 our congregation. And uh, so this is the hurricane season. This is a season where huge, huge windstorms come up and can destroy. Who would have thought that something as big as a hurricane and as powerful as a hurricane could be stopped completely by Sahara dust? <laughs> and how big is dust? <laughs> and so you start to see this relationship between the dust in the air. On the other side of the planet. On the other side of the planet is stopping the formation of hurricanes. Uh, are we all in relationship with each other, even to the very smallest particle? And I think that's a really important observation uh, that I made for myself, which is that there are no extra parts. There are no parts that don't play an important role and there is no enemy. Uh, we've also enjoyed watching these animal programs that show their interdependence. <clears throat> In other words, one was showing uh, how these, what were they deer? They were little deer, yeah. weren't they? On yeah. the and they were following the monkeys uh, and where the monkeys would eat because the monkeys were very messy eaters and they would get the berries and the trees uh, that the deer couldn't get to, but they drop a lot of them. So the deer get to eat what the monkeys drop. So they follow the monkeys around and therefore get to eat a preferred food. Right. Uh, and the other one was, uh, it was a, a long, Bill, Bill Horn, uh, yeah, something like Bill Horn, a yeah. big one from South Africa. And he was hopping around following what was he following? I don't know what animals he was following now, but the animals that he was following, he was alerting them to birds of prey that were up in the air that, you know, would, would, could eliminate any, any of them. So they're watching out for each other. They're looking out for each other. Here's two completely different species looking out for each other. And I think we, we don't necessarily think that everything Yes, he would make a noise to alert them oh, yeah, that yeah. there was a, an eagle or some bird of prey up there and uh, so they were cooperating that way because when he followed them he got to eat some of the food they left behind they were little four-footed critters yeah, I, I can't know. remember yeah. what they were but but it was really interesting to see that kind of interdependency which we see we call it symbiosis we see it all with plants and and everything and and we humans have it too although in our particular country we are kind of raised and with a general philosophy of uh, rugged individualism you know that that we can do it uh, anyone can become successful if they work hard enough or things like that and and so we don't have this real sense of oneness that many cultures do including like japan there's it they're they they are not raised with this idea of rugged individualism individualism isn't even a concept there it's all about the group and your obligation to the group that's why as we're talking about gun violence and this week, the former Prime Minister Shinzo, uh, Shinzo Abe was just assassinated with a homemade shotgun. And it's, this was just unheard of. There are no guns in Japan. People don't die of gun deaths. They, they don't sell them. They don't, they, they don't make them. They don't buy them. Uh, even their police keep them locked up. What do they call that? In a police a box. box yeah or something uh, on the street. So they, the police doesn't, they don't carry them because the people don't have them, so they don't need them. And so this assassination was really a shock uh, to them and, and to the world uh, because it, it just doesn't happen there. They have much more of a we, we are one culture idea. And so as we try to adopt that, it starts with us, for me, it started with this philosophy, the spiritual philosophy that we're one in spirit. There's one spirit and we're all part of it. Um, Ernest Holmes says that if we will listen to the heartbeat of another, we'll hear the great rhythm of the universe resounding in us. Through our friends, the infinite speaks a divine language. Uh, and, and we noticed that this week, I in particular, because I was still quarantining from having COVID or it having me, whatever. <laughs> and uh, it, you know, it wasn't a long period of time, just two weeks, but uh, I really missed being able to go out and speak to people and go to stores and do my shopping. I was surprised how much having to stay home, largely alone, all by myself alone, I know. Um, that uh, even though I talked to people on the phone and get and talk to them on Zoom, that it was, it, it really, it really was painful. It was 
a bit of suffering and it took me back to my remember as a child uh, because we were having these movies like on the beach and whatnot where we were afraid of atomic destruction and so that in this movie on the beach an atom bomb goes off and there's these people are alone on the beach and they're going to be the last humans on earth and i thought oh my gosh what would it what would it be like if i were all alone on the earth with no other human beings existed and uh possibly not many animals so it was it was like one of the most scary thoughts i ever entertain myself with that how awful it would be to be alone so here where we're raised to be individuals and we see our differences from others and kids can be cruel to you and sometimes we don't think our parents are fair so things don't always go the way we want and yet we still know we need those people we we value them we we depend on them and we would be uh, desolate without them right so we, we need to remember those things. And, and when we look at like what's going on in our country, I don't want to try to solve all the problems, but um, you know, they, they have been done by, by barely adults who are mentally ill. They have never fit in. They've never belonged. They're angry. Uh, they want to get back at society. And, uh, and so they kill. But you know, every country in the world has individuals like that. Yeah. And you can't lock them all up, but we're the only ones who have done so available to them. So, you know, one side keeps saying, well, we just need to handle mental health. Well, good luck with that. As I said, you can't lock them all up, but um, we can do something about how available. Well, I, think, I think we need to accept that we are all in relationship with each other, whether we understand or, or, or like the relationship or not, we are. We are in relationship with the homeless people that are living in, on the streets. We are in relationship with the people who have fatal diseases and are dying in our hospitals. Uh, we are in relationship with the people who have serious mental illnesses. And so if we think about ourselves being in relationship with all of these people, then the question then is, how can I have this relationship be a favorable one for everyone? How can I have this relationship favor humanity. And I think one of the first things we do is we separate ourselves from each other. And then we're off the hook as far as having to deal with problems that don't have to do with us directly. And so if we would just accept that we are in relationship with the best and the worst of whatever is going on around us. Now the question is, what's my relationship with it? And can I change that? How can I affect that? Uh, two days ago, I was driving to work and uh, I was I passed a, a pickup truck and uh, and I think when I passed him, he, his interpretation of it is that I was too close to him. That is, I changed lanes in, in front of him too, too quickly. I didn't pay much attention to it because I was in relationship to the tr journey I was taking. We got to another light. I pulled ahead, he pulled ahead and literally crowded me off the road. And that was to tell me that he was unhappy. The fact that I could have lost my life or lost my car or hurt other people wasn't relevant. But I realized the relationship with him started in his early offense and his sensitivity to what I had, quote, done to him that allowed him to do to me. So then the question was, what will I do? Well, I was angry. I was frustrated. I was not happy. And so I had a choice. Will I follow him? Will I get even with him? And what I did was I simply said, you know, bless you on your way, uh, be well. And I came up to the next traffic light and he pulled up along next to me, didn't pull up all the way because he didn't want to be seen. Because he didn't he was, want to be eye to eye with he, you. He was, he was embarrassed, I think. But I think I have a choice in every relationship, even when it's a brand new relationship, and even when it starts off badly, to be a contributor to the outcome, to be a contributor to the outcome of what's going on in our world. When you think of yourself as a contributor to the outcome of whatever's going on in our world in terms of consciousness, that's a really important piece because our consciousness is impacting other people. My consciousness on the road at that particular moment had an impact on him and also on other drivers. Because had I decided that this is my chance to get even or to do something rude or, or, <clears throat> or as, as bad as I felt had been done to me, without meaning to, I would have involved everyone else on the road that was driving with me. I would, I would have been a participant with other people participating in activity that was not 
not good for anyone. And so we have to constantly, I think, be looking at what's my relationship to the thing that's going on and how can I improve it? How can I have this be, have a positive outcome? And I think that at the smallest level, if we were to view ourselves as important in this relationship with all of humanity, and that what we do makes a difference to all of humanity, and then opt to do the thing that is least intrusive and most supportive or most helpful of the relationship, my guess is things would go very differently than they're going right now. But what I see happening now with myself as well is that I operate too often out of what's good for me, but what do I need to get rather than how my relationship with everyone else who has needs also. So our, our close relationships are really important for our own development too, when we have negative or positive experiences with them. Carolyn May says this in Sacred Contracts. She says, the experiences and relationships you're meant to have are with your parents, children, close friends, and any people with whom you share a passion for something. Every relationship and experience is an opportunity for you to grow and transform your life. So we sometimes wonder why, why did I have this this uh, difficult relationship with my parent or my sibling or whatever? They're, they are if you look at them as all opportunities for growth. I mean, sometimes you have to learn patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to learn, you know, lots of different things, lots of tolerance for other people's weaknesses as well. But when you really get that we're in this together, why wouldn't you? do that. Sometimes you have to forgive people, uh, important people in your life po posthumously, in other words, after mm -hmm. they're, they're gone. Um, and I, I really recommend talking to them in, in, in your alone time, meditation time, talk to them because you'd be surprised. Sometimes they talk back to me and explain their point of view of why they did or why they were the way they were. And it just gives you an understanding Everybody is not like you. Everybody is different. And, and isn't that wonderful that we're all unique and yet at the same time, we're all one. So if we learn to value our relationships, even though they may be difficult and know that they're for us, not against us, this all helps us just bring peace in our lives and peace on earth. Well, we're all wired so differently with different things that we need desire and require, it's difficult sometimes to understand how that works, and particularly when it's different species or a, a different orientation. Uh, I was looking at a very beautiful bird with beautiful colors, beautiful wings, and I thought of the bird as having the freedom to fly and the freedom to move, and, and, and I was thinking about all these wonderful things, and then I watched the bird eat a bug, and I thought, you're beautiful and you eat bugs. Could I eat bugs? You know, and yes, you could. I could, but I, <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> no, I don't want to go out eating bugs. I'm thinking, how interesting. And, and and the bird didn't say to me, you know, here I am with the most beautiful feathers and the most beautiful wings and the most beautiful song, and I'm here stuck eating bugs. And I think <clears throat> we 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 have such a different diet for life. Uh, we have such a, a different recipe for living. And I think we need to honor that more than we do and honor our own process more than we do. And that comes back to us. How are you honoring the you in this relationship with the world? How are you acknowledging yourself? Uh, are you eating bugs? And if you are, please stop. <laughs> but I think it's it's an important piece that we, we don't recognize. We often compare ourselves with other people with a different diet, a different diet for life, a, a different recipe for living. And we measure ourselves against that diet and that recipe without realizing we didn't come here to be in the same relationship that other people are in with this world and this, in, in this universe. In that sense, we're individual, unique, original, and one of a kind. At the same time, we're dancing with and moving with and having our lives with species of all different sorts that are all doing the same thing with us. So here we are alone and together. Here we are with and, and, and isolated in some sense. Thich Nhat Hanh is a Buddhist monk. He just passed recently, uh, but he was from Vietnam and was, was a monk during the Vietnam War. He saw terrible atrocities as he walked across uh, Vietnam into Cambodia and whatnot. And he, he ended up having um, 
a respite area in France called Plum Village, I believe it was called. And anybody could come. Uh, and he didn't know he had no therapy for them. He did, did no talk therapy, did no, no therapy at all. He would just have them walk uh, in silence on the earth and appreciating the peace that, and, and love that came from the earth. But this is what he says. He recommends the practice of interbeing. He says, offer of one simple practice, the practice of interbeing of developing an awareness of our connection to others, to the earth, to the stars, and to the universe itself. We're made of the same stuff, the same elements, the same molecules. So, but you know, mostly what we see is our differences. Oh, I'm not like these people. Oh, look at that person. They are so this, or they are so that. Well, why can't I be like that person? Oh, I yeah. Why, why can't I have what they have, whatever. But we, we, we focus on our differences. And he says, so focus on interbeing, that focus on that we are both human beings here on earth at the same time, and focus on that connection uh, that we have with them. Because focusing on our difference just keeps us separate from. And so uh, to have a more enriched life, we want to practice knowing that other people are there for us as well. I, I, I want to end with this story. If I could, did you have something else? Yeah, I wanted to add, add something too, and that is, I think one of the biggest dilemmas we have is, is, is the constant asking for why. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to them? Why is this happening? I think we need to spend less time with the why and more time with the how will I be with this? How will I be with the illness that is affecting someone close to me? How will I be with myself as I see this, this process unfolding? When we get stuck in the why is this happening to me or this happening to them or why is this happening, we, we stop the relationship of being with as if somehow the why would solve everything. If I just knew why, everything would be better. The why doesn't really answer the question of how will I be in relationship. And so you can ask the question why. If you get an answer, that's wonderful. But if you don't, that's not a place to hang out. The place to hang out is how will I be in this life with you? How will I be in this life with me? moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day, year to year for the lifetime. Yeah, well said. So this is a true story from a minister by the name of Scott Aubrey. And he says, when I was eight years old, I caught myself on fire one morning, getting ready for school. We had an open flame gas heater in the bathroom that I stood too close to. Uh, you know what they say when this happens, stop, drop and roll. Well, I used a different strategy. Uh, scream like hell and 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 run. <laughs> Dad tackled me in the kitchen, threw himself on me, smothered the flames with his body and his hands. As he was on top of me, I remember looking into my dad's eyes and knew I was going to be okay. I knew that he was saving me. Ever since that day, when I look into his face and into the eyes of my father, I knew that I was going to be okay. That's a true story. It's also a metaphor. Look into the face of your father, your mother. Look into the eyes of the people who love you and know that you're going to be okay. You're not alone. Spirit will throw itself on the fire for you. Your dad, mom, friends, people in this community will throw themselves on the fire for you. We are here to save each other. But if you feel there's no one who will do that for you, then you be the savior. Find something in common to love with others, deepen those relationships, throw yourself on the fire for someone else. Right, and it really works on the, what will I do rather than why is this happening to me? How then shall I live? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we're gonna uh, end here and we're gonna move into uh, music that we selected. And but first we're gonna make a request that you support our ministry and that you support it by donating to this. Uh, and is gonna show you what, what it is that we're gonna ask you to donate to. We're at Not For Profit, uh, Center for Spiritual Living. This is our website right here, cslpalmbeaches.org. And if you go there on your phone or your computer, uh, this is the opening page and there's a little button right here that says ways to donate. And, that, and this will open up and show you ways that you can donate. 
but we also like to do this affirmation of prosperity uh, for to increase all of our personal prosperity so that we have more to give. And so if you want to say it along with me, it is that my investment today is made with the full realization that God is the source of my supply and returns it to me enriched and multiplied. Think about, so it is. think about saying that to yourself every day. Think about saying that to yourself in every way and not just in finances, but in the abundance of consciousness. Indeed. So I'm going to stop that <clears throat> screen share and then we're going to, I'm going to share this wonderful. Oh, we have to end. end, the, end the Sorry about that. First, we have to end.